Welcome to another episode of Blender TV with your favorite Blender Tainer, Master Xeon. So in this video, um, I just do a study on a cat that I have here. Um, the cat that I have is pretty adorable. I wasn't a big fan of him at first, and then they, you know, got him checked out, and he doesn't have fleas or diseases. So, you know, that makes him an alright cat in my book. So these pictures you see here are pictures I took using a camera, and I just took them in paint and cropped them and resaved them since it was a lot quicker than using Photoshop and I turned the timeline and the outliner into UV image editors by clicking the little pin icon on each of them it makes the images stay in place and so I drop in a cube as usual and I think I oh yeah I actually ignore the first six minutes of this so I begin modeling and while I put out a video previously talking about how great 2.67 is, this video shows that 2.67 is definitely needing that A release. So, you know, just because Blender crashes doesn't mean that it's necessarily bad. It just means that you got to remember that Blender is a program that's in the state of development. So you can't spoil yourself thinking that the crashing days are over, like in 2.57 and such, when just simple operations sometimes would just kill the whole program and it was just a gamble from one keystroke to the next but you know as far as polymodeling goes the reason I even show you all this since it's not even valid is just to give it all a, an idea kind of of what I'm going to do before I actually do it on this more serious attempt but with all these forms you know they look pretty daunting until you break it down into a series of planes and then begin separating those planes into their subplanes and expanding on the form until it looks like the picture and less like a cube. But in this attempt you'll see that I do start out with a cube using the knife tool as always to show my dominion over vertices in general. Being able to just come in and knife and by using these tools and not worrying about topology I'm able to reduce the amount of work I have to do while sculpting to try to get that form. Not to say that it's impossible to get it while sculpting, but I have much better control using the edit mode selection tools of edge and vert and proportional and bevel and knife compared to say my modified standard brush that I use as a damn, damn standard and the polish brush and sculpting. You know, those usually get the job done, but controlling the vertices beforehand definitely makes it a lot quicker but like I said in a moment blender will crash and I'll have to start all over so notice that I do not save it all throughout this whole part and it's like 30 minutes of me going through and just working on this thing without saving that's just another example but in this attempt, I also, you know, try to free model it without having any sort of reference image in the viewport. So I'm just looking at the pictures and putting it together. So there's no accuracy, which in retrospect, I see it, obviously. But, you know, at the time, I'm just trying to block in some forms to begin to go off of. So in between the first crash, I take some more pictures of the cat. But this is a strange cat. And because of that he's not very easy to take pictures of because he's always running around because his owners are always giving him catnip but once I was able to get the cat to sit still long enough he was more entertained by the flash of the camera and I was able to get all these pictures of him from the front but try to get a picture of him from the side it's a different story so more cutting and setting to try to get the little I guess the little divot on his nose, try to add in the loop for the eyes. At this point he's looking more like a like a tiger or something. And I see here that the video I put up yesterday now has three hundred views. So as celebration, I'll be putting this video up immediately. So, of course, thank all the YouTubers for your continued support. It does 
keep me going making these videos and trying to improve upon them to make them better and better. All right, so sorry about the radio silence there. Um, like I said, this is still just a first attempt, so really just be trying to just kind of get an idea of the model and technique that I use here, which is mainly just chaos connections, you know. I just draw verts out, and then I try to account for them later. But, you know, whenever it comes to sculpting, you know, so pretty much all my models end in a sculpt and in a retopology. And that's pretty much because it's the best workflow to go about it. Like I was having a conversation with someone earlier on a forum about sculpting and he was saying that he wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. And after talking to him, I felt like I remember I once said that same thing, like I'll never sculpt because, you know, I'm just a pixel pusher. I'm not a, trying to be a Michelangelo here, but the thing is, is that with polygons, you do have a limited amount of control, and your control that you have is limited only to your edge flow. So there we go, Blender crashed, and now we're getting serious. So that's not the file, but that's what it recovered. Why did it recover a file that I never even saved? Whatever. So we drop into Icosphere 8 divisions and try to locate these cat pictures. Uh, they're somewhere. and divide up the timeline after converting it to a UV and we'll just start dropping cats on it. Only seven minutes deep and it looks like we are in for an adventure together. So one of the first things I wanted to do in this particular model is go ahead and just put the eyeballs there so I have that as my main placeholder point to build the rest of the model off of which usually I put the eyeballs in whenever I feel like it or you know but this time I actually put them in off the bat and just make a mirror drop in the picture again and this time we're just going to try to more accurately match the proportions of the photos of this particular cat um, this cat's name is actually Perseus, by the way. But at this portion, you see me drop in a plane, begin tracing it around after deleting all the verts, and then shrink wrap it onto the eyeball so that way the contour of the eye is already matched by this. And then by using one of Blender's latest tools, the knife project, I'll try to project that vertice cut onto the circular mesh and by doing that it gives me a um, it pretty much projects using the knife that object which sounds pretty cool it, it is it's pretty useful for making things join together but it is still a work in progress so for more complex meshes it doesn't divide very well but um, as far as finding out more information about the knife project that's something you'll have to read about in the Blender Wiki, but just keep in mind that it is one of your options in the um, T-Panel over on the right side. So if you just select one object, then select the other, go into edit mode with both objects selected and choose knife project, it'll project the geometry onto the other one. So it is pretty handy, but once it gets more well developed, it'll definitely become a formidable part of my workflow as far as um, the rapid kit bashing of even just polygonal models. But the more work I do here, the less work I have to do while sculpting. 
And so I'm just trying to nail down the form. In fact, sometimes I find myself doing this step and the geometry will just bend to my will in a way that I just find it unnecessary to even have to sculpt it. And I'll just use that at a subdivision, start, you know, putting in my credential creases and start nailing down the form. The nose looks awful. And so the nose will continue to look awful for a moment. And so, as you can see, the knife project is a success. So now it's just, you know, filling in these uh, vertices to actually connect the edges so I can put in some edge loops and begin to work it in. But nailing in the eye area is what's going to allow me to really get the forms in the planes that are surrounding the cheek and jaw area, which I think are the strong indicators on this cat that make it what what I consider attractive. All right, I'm back. So you see in the middle picture of the UV image editor at the bottom that there's a very distinctive shape for the jawline and the front snout of the, of the creature we're modeling here. So we really want to nail that down accurately. Um, and that'll add, you know, credulum to the cat. So with each area that I correct and make closer to the form adds more to this to make it less of a lifeless block of vertices and more into the youthful face of a cat so you know whenever you're modeling you want to take a really hard look at your model and compare it to other people that are much better than you or at least that's just what I do and I used to model and think that I would never, ever, ever get there. And now I'm seeing that, you know, these really beautiful pieces, these fantastic 3D models are not so far away. And the secret really is just time, diligence, and looking for planes. There's anatomy, and then there's just studying planar forms. And if you just nail down forms, you can save yourself a ton of time studying anatomy or you can just not even worry about it at all and just have your models look all blocky like your standard reddit user or 4 -chaner. but I kinda went off on a tangent there sorry so focusing back on pulling in verts, pulling out verts there's a nice little area that comes in right outside that I don't know what you call that the I guess the cheek area the 
the cat cheek area. There's a crease that goes along on the inside that I think once I began indicating it really began to bring it all together because I thought here it began to look a little French. Maybe I need to add more divisions here, start trying to define the chin area. But, you know, making a head without a neck is not going to allow you a whole lot of room for nailing down the forms in the chin area. So I realized that, and so I start coming in for the ears to try to close up the shape in general and then come back to that jaw area. And so as you can also see from the picture in the middle, barely, is that there is a slight curve in the shape of the cat's ear. And so you definitely want to nail that down as well. <clears throat> and, you know, these are things I'm emphasizing on because, you know, before I modeled a cat, I went and looked up the best of cat modeling videos. And once I finish this, I think this will be the better of them. But, you know, most of the models of cats I saw weren't very impressive. But... You know, with Blender getting better and having cycles and GPU hair, you know, why not just jump in this program and make a cat? That's what I thought initially, but just know that this video does end in a blue screen. So, you know, I'm actually reading here on my email people giving me YouTube advice about how to deal with blue screens, and at first I was disregarding it, but, you know, with the more crashing that happens, the more this advice I need to probably look into so I know I definitely need to reinstall my OS my Windows is completely bloated and I don't know why um, like I mean I got a terabyte hard drive and I have about 19 gigs free but I watch a lot of videos tutorials and such but yeah I really just need to clear it out and just start all over with the system because it used to be screaming and I mean, it is an i5, and it came out like last year, so it's not a dated computer. But, you know, enough about my personal problems. By extruding neck, now I can look at the cat, cat's face as a face, and not just some floating head in space. And we slap a matte cap on it. So, usually whenever I use blenders, I guess... Vertice autocorrect is what I think of it now. Whenever I have a bunch of end guns like you saw before, just vertices without endings, and I apply a subdivision, it actually converts all of them to quads, which I think is just awesome. But in this instance, you actually see me apply not a cat mark mole subdivision, but a simple subdivision. And that just kept the original planes that I established during the poly modeling stage but adding more geometry and then I added this level of smooth to just kind of interplay between those planes a bit and now I'm getting in here sculpting so you know I'm playing with the brushes for a minute now a couple of things about the sculpting and dynamic topology you always see me use dynamic topology but never the actual built-in blender leveling sculpt system and that's because you know even though they're built from the same system they don't really feel like the same system the leveling system I don't know I just always felt like I'm not really touching my geometry I'm just moving air or something but with the dynamic it actually I don't know gives resistance to my strokes which allows me to have a better filling and connection with my clay but enough about that so when it comes to your numerical number of your topology level in dynamic topology, I'll usually lower the number down and try to use it to densen up areas that I don't want to be decimated by the smoothing. So the farther I'm away, the bigger the polygons it creates are. And then when you see me zoom in, that's me sharpening up the form. So you know, you zoom out, work on it as a whole, and then zoom in there, get some details. You'll also see me play with the masking features of Blender a little bit, which is something I never use, but you press M, go to the mask brush, except the thing with the masking is you won't see masking if you're in matte cap mode. So you will have to turn off matte cap and then go in and 
draw your mask and then turn matcap back on. But the good thing about that is you can see your matcap and not see your mask. So you get one of the things I take for granted in ZBrush for free in Blender as well, and that is being able to hide your mask while you sculpt around. And that's how you pretty much, you know, control some of these broader movements that you're making with the clay. But as far as sculpting goes, I watch uh, quite a few sculpting videos on YouTube and have a quite a collection of artists that I follow. For example, Zebro and Mark Ken Venter, which you'll see him on likes and history since I'm always checking them out and just watching how they go about making work of it. So the ears had some normals that were inverted and I didn't notice it until later on in the sculpt mode and it caused me some trouble so you'll see me deal with that now when it comes to the ears I tried to use masking to hide the back part because whenever it comes to sculpting blender doesn't have back face masking like ZBrush where you can sculpt on one side of a thin series of polygons and it won't affect the normals on the opposing side if there are certain closeness but you see me try to fix that here and it doesn't really work out very well but you know whatever and the main goal with the sculpting was at first I was gonna just sculpt this cat put fur on it uh, poly paint it and call it a day but the ears messed up so bad that I ended up having to just start over. Now, for some reason, it went dark. Let's see. All right, here we go. So I guess Blender crashed, and now I'm on the stage two where I'm bringing in more pictures of the cat. So every time Blender crashed, I just took a break, photographed the cat, cropped the pictures, and just prepared to begin recording again. Because in the times that Blender crashes, I have decreed that instead of just giving up or rage quitting, I should just get in there, build it again as quick as I can. And I do it all the time. Blender will just completely crash or ZBrush and I'll just lose my model. And I'll just go in there with Dynamesh and just carve it up in Fairy to try to, you know, show the program who's boss. Because, you know, you let your program crash and kill your work and you lose your best work at that moment. You lose confidence in the pen. And confidence in the pen is a, it's a lecture in itself, you know. And that's pretty much, you know, your ability to pick up a pencil and make a work of art just on demand whenever you want. But that's something I still work on myself. So Blender crashed and put me back about this far. And so y'all get to actually see me go through the process again, which is the unfortunate part of this video. But using the knowledge of seeing it crash before, y'all got to see the technique in advance, hear me explain it, as well as get to see me do it again completely different, or at least a correction. So with the ears, it got a little confusing, but I was just determined to just get this thing back into sculpt mode and just make some of the necessary connections and get rid of that Mufasa chin that he had. And so I go with a different matte cap this time to show to maybe a uh, trick blender thinking it's someone else using it. And I just began nailing down those forms again.
and just more sculpting. So there's a lot of forms that are unnatural here, but you know that's one of the advantages of going in and sculpting is, is I can nail in some of these more organic curves and planes here. But really, when I'm looking at the picture, all I'm looking at are geometric planes. Like if I had a plane, could I balance it on that area of his face or this area? And if so, then that area is flat according to that degree of view. I mean, hopefully that makes sense. So this, the overall silhouette of his head was also incorrect and was incorrect for a long time. And at this point, you see me correct it, something I didn't do in my previous sculpt. So, you know, the knowledge of those potential improvements have definitely been passed along to this succession. So... I mean, Wall Blender crashed earlier and made me have to start completely over and, you know, waste my time, waste y'all's time showing y'all. It still had some benefits as far as showing me what I need to improve. So, even though there's a lot of fur obstructing it, there are anatomical forms of the cat that must be honored. And, you know, in advance to this video, I also looked up a, a video about how to draw cats and just a couple of pictures that people drew of just cat studies to just kind of get an understanding of what features they were centering in on to make a circle with arrows be considered a cat and a lot of it was in the jaw the shape of the air blender crashed again but that's okay this time I started saving because I started to get tired of that crap but here you see me flip the normals and try to sculpt and because there's normals that are inverted it just got strange and as I tried to fix it it got stranger so the cat's face was just inside out in certain places and the normals was just horrible and the fact of the matter was is I used dynamic topology so it was so dense that I couldn't just select faces and just go about it I couldn't just select the ring and just beautify fill you know it just turned into a nightmare so I just closed blender and I opened it up again and I just decided to, you know, I remembered that the first time I flipped the normals it worked out. But I try to go ahead and just fill these faces anyways. Going into texture mode just to try to see some open holes and find out what to do. And, you know, that'll work, so... I think I symmetrize it again, which will make both sides have the exact same geometry since I don't want to correct it on the other side as well. And I just rapidly start trying to finish up the cat. So I noticed that the neck was looking a little scrawny and that for a bust, maybe I shouldn't have it as a big open hole at the bottom, seeing that that would make it hard to sculpt. So I closed that up by just extruding it and then beautify filling and flipping the normals on the inside. And back under the chin to just, you know, work in this form some more. And so, now that I have much of the planar structure indicated, you know, it looks like a cat. You take this cube and show it to someone and it will think it's a cat. And a big hole in the ear just appears. And... There's nothing I can really do about it because this is dynamic topology, not Dynamesh, where I can just drop in a sphere and just remesh it to fill in the holes. So this is where I pretty much came to the conclusion that, yeah, I'm probably going to have to retopologize this thing. But no, no biggie. We'll just harden out these forms. Get the draw brush, put an inner crease for the mouth to really indicate that. Probably just giving it whiskers would help this cat along in this way. 
And we're also going to need to flatten out that lower area of the jaw so it doesn't look like he's holding a mouthful of snuff. Put this little area in. And like I always say, taking the um, standard brush and changing the curve to be more inverted will give it a, a smaller degree of fall off and allow you to really crease in there and create hard edges in your sculpts and nail down things a lot easier, which I think is one of the things that really helped Blender's uh, sculpt mode sell for me finally. Because for the longest time, I just thought of it kind of as a bit of a joke. But now that I see that it's integrated into Blender, so by integrating it directly into your workflow, it becomes a pretty powerful tool. I've been able to become a lot better as an artist for it. And add more mess to the nose. Flatten it in. And using the standard to harden it back up, as well as put the line in the middle that's showing in this picture on the right. So at this point, I'm pretty proud of how the model's looking, but not of this jaw flab and some of these unnatural shapes that are catching light. Oh yeah, so I made him dance to a song for a moment. Back to work. And in the Photoshop, I take another break to get this time pictures of the cat from the side because I want to make sure that I at least nail down the forms in the sculpt since I didn't do it in the polygon mode. And I'm about to retopologize and try to get a final model here. So these pictures are pretty much my best attempt at getting the cat sideways. That's how rambunctious this little bugger is. It just will not let you... It's just something about a camera. The cat is very interested in the camera. So getting it sideways is just pretty difficult. I was having to snap my fingers and stomp to get him to look away or to look over at something else. So I'm sculpting around to try to get a good connection between the head and the neck. But really at this point I'm just looking at the lights, on the, I mean the highlighting on the matte cap and from there judging exactly where to bring in mass, uh, bring out mass to try to just get a nice rounded organic form. But you know this cat has a dent right there like he's been hit with a shovel. So I smooth that out, and the transition between the jaw and the neck also looks unnatural. Hopefully I correct that as well. But, you know, I'm, I'm overall I'm pleased with the results of the sculpt. Not so much the video, so, you know, that's not, that's not good, but... I asked for it. I did give it a thousand strands of fur. And then I gave it 400 children. I know better than that. So to make the whiskers, I brought in a bezier curve and just use face snapping to just drop it on the surface. And that's, I mean, when it comes to whiskers, that's all there is to it. Just drop in some curves. I mean, curves is, they're like vertices, except you get two handles on each of them to control the bending in between so it's just an easier level of control I mean I could have used verts and extruded and solidified 
but I mean, look at this. I just and created some curves, gave it a bevel object of a bezier circle, scaled it down, mirrored it, and then I'm going to just select all the tips and then use Alt S to, you know, make them taper at the tip. So I start off putting a plane, I just move it over, that way the mirror point's in the middle. And I start off using B surfaces to make this, but in the end I just end up pulling it out. But with B surfaces, you just have to enable the add-on, and you can just use your grease pencil after choosing to draw on the surface, and you can just draw geometry and pretty much retopo it by drawing. So that's also another reason why if you don't have a tablet you should probably invest in one is because you know this 3d stuff is aimed for the functionality of artists so I mean a lot of this stuff is tablet ready and pressure sensitivity takes you a long ways as far as sculpting as far as painting as far as texturing I mean you just use it everywhere so much that you never really think about it but if I had to use a mouse for a day, it wouldn't be a very good day. But not to say that the mouse is impossible. I just prefer the tablet. So y'all know my retopping strategy. I try to come in and just circle, make circular shapes around the critical forms, and then just fill in the blanks. But like I said, I, was, I start off using B surfaces and I just forget about it altogether. But it is also because at these points, um, you do want to have a large degree of control where you put your geometry since this is your final model that you're going to be showing off to people. I mean, once I'm done with this, I might put it on Sketchfab or something, but I think I should do a better job with the texturing. But you'll see the final result. But just to let you know, unfortunately, the video does end prematurely due to a blue screen, but I do finish building the model, and I'm just only adding the hair. And so I pull out a second window and make that one only show just the geometry and not the entire, entire mesh. And that is by just pressing the um, num number pad slash and going into local mode just on another view. So that's also pretty useful. And I'll pause for some unknown reason, but I'm back. You know, all in all, in retrospect, I wasn't very pleased with the overall topology that I got in the end. However, usually I just try to get get it as dense as I have to to get the shapes that I put in during the sculpting and try not to miss anything that would require me to have to use a displacement map or anything. But I think I do need to put a bit of work into maybe get some lower poly models than the ones that I get here since they're all since the models I make are always with the geometry that would be optimal for production or at least going into sculpting and raising it up to the level of production but you know I could have definitely have retopologized this a lot simpler and I think because of the complexity that I used here it took a longer amount of time than it could have been
And I think at this point I realize I may have missed some critical loops, but I just don't care because I'm not going to go in and add additional loops to harden up any of the details because it's going to be completely covered in fur. And not to mention, I think I have a pretty nice looking lower poly view over in this local mode on the right side. So if that sounds like nonsense, that's because it probably is. But after nailing down the face, it becomes a lot faster. I mean, you'll see me get into some troubles down here in the lower jaw, but I use a classic technique to um, reduce the amount of polygons, what I mean the amount of geometry you'll see in just one moment. So I extrude once, place to fit. Now keep in mind whenever I'm retopologizing that the mesh that I'm using that's the plane is in solid mode and the sculpt is also in solid mode. However, you don't see that the mesh that I'm actually building on top of it isn't penetrating and that's because under clip under the end panel it sets to 0 0.5 instead of its default. So that's something that you should experiment and mess with until you understand it because it's something um, I really didn't really understand until I paid a lot of attention to it in one of Kent Trammell's videos and basically it's the easiest way to retopologize without losing visual side of your um, mesh that you're currently expanding on which if you've done a lot of retopology you know that that's kind of an issue So like I said, all these extrusions from the mouth I think resulted in a lot of geometry. And so I take a look at this and I'm like, OMG, why do I need his chin to have almost, you know, 18 verts to convey that shape? So you see me merge them into tries and then turn them into quads. Since this isn't necessarily going to be deforming, I feel like you get away with it. So now I'll pull it down and it's 9 verts. So it's a much happier ending. But those are things that you want to keep in mind also whenever you're modeling is redirecting your edge flow and turning your long lines of verts and edges into, you know, tri diamonds that I mean, or diamond quads that reduce your vertice onslaught, I guess is the only way to explain it. You know, with a lot of this stuff, I just kind of model it, just think about what it is that I'm doing, and I just try to put words on it to explain it. Like, you know, he's diddle daddling that edge there. But, you know, let's focus back on the task at hand. So, filling in this area in the back will nail down a large part of this model and begin to bring this story to a happy ending. And now that I'm retopologizing, Blender isn't crashing anymore. So I might have to do a bug report or something, but, you know, just remember to save your files and check your autosave settings to make sure that they're working in your favor. Because if they're not, then it's just a waste of an autosave file, and a lot of the time I don't even mess with it, but... I mean, actually, to be honest, lately I've been able to just get in and finish a model without it crashing. But today is not my day. But I was determined to do this cat. I mean, Blender crashed four times, and I was like, it's trying to stop me. It knows that this is going to turn out to be good, so I'm going to finish. And so now filling in the ears, just running these edges up the side. Like I almost look at it like playing a game of risk. Like the verts are 
my pawns in a chess game. I'm just running them through military maneuvers of looping and twirling into themselves and sea looping and becoming poles. My pillars of strength that have no strength at all. In fact, poles should be avoided, but you get the idea here. And if I could just fill this in and not have to edge loop anything, then I could just call this a checkmate. And if I could do a better job at if, if I could do a better job at retopologizing the air than I did at initially modeling it and then subsequently sculpting it, and then even more subsequently trying to hide it, then I'll have done all right. But I mean, the, the thing about topology is it really only matters as much as your model does. I mean, if you have it planned for deformation, if you have it planned as just being a showpiece, if you just plan to put it online and just make it a just a static model, then, you know, your topology can be carried out different ways. But for mine, I always have animation in mind, like, I think if this video would have went without crashing horribly and blue screening and causing me to feel the need to just end this video and just put it out and maybe come back with a part two or something depending on how this video is received then you know maybe I can have it open his mouth and meow and put in teeth and gums and try to go for a more complete cat but as far as the geometry here I only use enough to indicate the form you know I want it to look very much like a cat even without hair and I think that's one of the things that maybe I fall short on when modeling is that I put too much effort into making it look good, even untextured or even just with ambient occlusion. And, you know, by modeling that way, you end up spending a lot of more time with the geometry than you have to. So, I mean, a lot of time you'll see me just go the lazy route. I mean, when you see me just go with vertex paint and not UV unwrap, that's me taking the easy way. And while the easy way isn't always the best way, the easy way is definitely the easier way. So, depending on the model, I do take it quite a bit. In fact, in this model, I take the vertex paint route because I felt the, the coloring for it would be relatively simple for the under skin, you know, just showing on them beneath the fur. So, I didn't put a whole lot of effort into it. So, with vertex paint, like I always say, it's only as dense as your geometry, so since this is a simplified one, I can't really paint it that deep. But, I would say right here, we we're looking at a finished cat, and, you know, the geometry is nice, the form is nice, it has eyeballs, and so I decided to take it a step further and go into cycles and begin rendering it. And so when it comes to HDRIs, I get them from everywhere. I just spend a lot of time on Google Googling free HDRIs. And then I spend a lot of time on Google Googling how to get HDRIs that cost money for free. So, you know, if you really need HDRIs, drop me a message and I'll send you one. But, I mean, for the most part, um, you can just find them anywhere on the Internet. And you don't even have to have the most expensive ones. The ones I like the most are the ones that you get for free off a of Blender cookie that are just random ones they took because I think that the file sizes are real nice and they work well with Blender for the most part and don't have um, any sort of artifacting or extreme values that cause it to crush the overall picture. But I'll go through a couple of HDRIs because I usually stick with the same standard ones and this time I wanted to go for something different. Whenever you're using image-based lighting, you always want to make sure you check the button underneath um, the, all that, all those options that talks about importance, import, making an importance map or something, because that'll get rid of some of the fireflies that you'll get during renders a lot quicker 
then letting it grind for 1500 frames. So here I bring in my favorite um, material note setup that I use all the time that allows me to simulate SSS and cycles and I put that on so like I said I take the easy route here and I just use vertex paint now the cool thing about vertex paint is you can just select faces go in face select mode and then only fill that area so that's how you get precise paint filling you know like the bucket tool in Photoshop is you would just isolate in edit mode fill it so I'm just sampling picture colors on the cat and paint bucketing it on the 3D model. I mean, it's that easy. And this is something that, you know, you just got to spend a lot of time just messing around with. And eventually you'll just get in your head how it works and you'll integrate it perfectly into your workflow. And so vertex painting is something you see used a lot more in ZBrush um, because you're dealing with a lot denser models, so you have a much higher resolution palette to work with. But I think it also has a place in Blender. I mean, for base coats, it does the job. And in cycles, you can call on your vertex paint with just an attribute node. You can go in with vertex paint and put a cavity mask, which you'll see me do right here. The, having a cavity mask and being able to multiply that in using an attribute node and calling on it in cycles is actually very powerful and allows you to have a additional layer of colorization to work with, whether you're wanting to add shadowing in crevice regions or um, reduce the specularity to certain areas. I mean, it has tons of uses. And, I mean, the alternative is UV rapid, convert it to values or something, but I just use attributes. And if I become too fond of it, I'll make a shadeless mat, bake it to a UV. And now we get serious. So I start dropping in the fur. So let me tell you that the ending is close and it's about five minutes away. So you see me drop in the fur and I start off, um, you know, I think my roommate was in here at this time and I was telling him I bet I could make this cat have a full body of fur with only 20 strands of hair. Well, he left the room, so instead of putting 20 strands of fur, I ended up putting a thousand and then using 400 children, which end up crashing the computer. But before that, I do try a couple of different ways of going about it. Now, if you look at the cat picture closely, you see that in the center of his face, on his nose and in his eye area, that fur is definitely shorter than the fur around it. So I could have went in with particle paint or particle mode and cut it and made it shorter, or I could just use a vertex group um, white paint system to control which areas are long and which areas aren't. And so you'll see me do that throughout this um, once I get pretty far. Usually with the fur, I'll just try to get it done using few parents and many children. But you could go about it however you like. But using as few parents as possible definitely makes it a lot easier to control and I mean if I was trying to put like curly locks or something on this cat then it would definitely be a lot easier that way and so here you see me making the first group and by choosing a gate I'm able to not put fur in his mouth or his eyeballs or in certain areas of his ear and here you see me create the map for the short fur so I'm just painting random well not randomly but I'm just painting just the areas where I want it to be short. And since I don't want it to be incredibly short, I use some of the weight painting tools that have been added like levels to try to make it have a nicer distance and just be a little, a little shorter, but not substantially shorter. But here you see that more adjustments needed. So I'll go in and play with levels again. I start going back to green, but you can see the fur growing in real time. So by just tweaking the offset and the gamma of the weight painting colors, I'm able to get the result very easily. So this is a pretty good workflow for this sort of thing. However, if I was making a 
full cat body, I would probably want to use some UV maps to try to reduce the amount of fur that I'm having to use and whatnot. It really would depend on whether I'm going for a close-up shot or a far away render, but you know, with this cat I might as well finish the body and make it a part of something. So I'll play with the first size, begin rendering it, and one of the things that bothers me the whole time is the fact that I can see his flesh through the fur. So this is an area where I think I came short on the last attempt of the cat, and that you see in the pictures it definitely has enough fur to encompass everything, but you don't want to put so much fur that it looks like a damn teddy bear. So. There's a fine line you have to follow there, and I think this is where particle mode would come in and actually brushing and managing the fur, because you want it to lay down, but you also want it to be a thick coat. And so I put in a glossy shader so that way it actually catches some light and reflects a bit, and try to mess with the fur a bit more, add more children, and I'm getting a lot closer to the look. So it's a stalemate between increasing the children and increasing the size of the strands. And let me tell you, adding more children was the wrong gamble. I should have just made it thicker, should have just combed it more. But still a good attempt and time lapse nonetheless. Now as far as color in the fur, you don't see me go over that at all in this, but I guess the way that I would do it would be creating the UV map and then just painting the stripes imitating the look that I see on his face, which I think I might actually make another video and come back and just do a texturing job on this as well as get vengeance on the fur and not let it defeat me. But the video is nearing its conclusion so you'll see me come in, brush the fur, and I feel Blender's getting ready to crash. It's getting slow. You know, things I'm pressing are still on the screen, so I'm feeling very nervous. The fur also looks very strange and inside out. So the panic grows. And then I go to render. And that's it. That's pretty much the end of the video. So I got an unhandled exception error. I begin to panic and wonder what this instant message is on the other side. I never find out because the computer crashes. I should have just found out. And that'll do it. Happy Blender.